wouldn't have written this well. Something we talked about last week was, oh, he's a fisherman, he wasn't very well educated. But this is, this is not only written in Greek, it's written in educated Greek. Uh, you'll notice from some of our different books of the Bible, uh, a book like Luke, written by a doctor, is actually, the Greek is much better than the book of Mark. Uh, and so people question Peter's authorship of this book, but it's a weird thing to have, because I think all that Peter does in Scripture, you know, what, what are some of the more miraculous things that, have, that happen with Peter throughout the Bible? What about Pentecost? Yeah, he got up and spoke like a God used to. Well, I mean, out of, out of all the miraculous things that Peter does, either before Pentecost or after, you know, the, the, the fact, fact that this is the one that we say, oh, he couldn't have done this, is a weird thing to say. But also, um, we also hear, you see, in, in um, the Greek style is, is also... Uh, chapter 5, we see he's written this letter by, uh, by Silas. And so he's not even actually the one writing, penning it. And so it's just a strange thing people have. But people always try to find a reason why so-and-so couldn't have written such a book. But other than that, uh, we all pretty much agree Peter wrote First and Second Peter. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and jump into page 5, where it goes to... Uh, 1 Peter, this week is 1 Peter 1, 1 through 12. So it's a good chunk of the first of the beginning of 1 Peter. I'm going to jump down to the context. Uh, Peter wrote the letter follow, to followers of Jesus Christ scattered across the Roman Empire. Remember we said he was writing from Babylon. But Babylon was, we, as in the introduction, more of a type. He's probably writing from the Roman Empire. Uh, this targeting of believers likely began in the wake of Emperor Nero's burning of Rome, an act he promptly blamed on Christians. As a preeminent apostle at the time, Peter recognized the great need to help the maligned and the mistreated brothers and sisters uh, gain a right perspective and stand firm in the midst of suffering. So taking pen in hand, he reminded his audience of the centuries uh, a certainty of the future inheritance that is guaranteed to believers in Jesus Christ. So that's really what this theme is going to be about. We're going to go jump ahead to uh, the text on page 7. But that's what we're going to see throughout 1 Peter. 2 Peter will be different. But 1 Peter will be talking a lot about persecution. The persecution they are facing. They are in the midst of it. Uh, Nero is persecuting believers. And Peter is writing to them, even though they were scattered throughout the Roman Empire. Uh, anyone want to read the text for us? First Peter 1, 1 through 12. <laughs> Nobody's had enough coffee yet. <laughs> is that fun? Is that good? Where is it? It's right Page here. 7. Page 7. Right here. Read away. I read. First Peter, which is <clears throat> Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the pilgrims of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father in sanctification of the Spirit for obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Grace to you and peace be multiplied. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed at the last time. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, 
you have been grieved by various trials. And that the genuineness, genuineness of your faith being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Seven, are we down? No, keep, keep going. Whom having not seen you love, whom having not seen you love, though now you do not see him, yet believing you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Of this salvation the prophets have inquired and searched carefully, who prophesied of the grace that would come to you. All right, uh, verse 11. Uh, oh, where's 11? Oh, uh, there's two more verses on the next page. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. Search, <laughs> searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ who was in them was indicating when he testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would come. To them it was revealed that not to themselves but to us they were ministering the things which now have been reported to you through those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit, sent from heaven, things which angels desire to look into. Thank you. Um, okay, so we started at the beginning. Um, it's Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, the pilgrims of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, and on. Uh, question number one. What is significant about calling believers pilgrims? What does this term suggest for us as modern day believers? We're on a journey. Okay, we're on a journey. Uh, back on page seven, there's some very small text next to, next to it. It kind of defines certain words. Uh, what does it say for pilgrims there? Strangers dispossessed in a land, not their own, or a temporary residence, or Absolutely. So, he's calling them pilgrims. Now, uh, so, so, so some of them actually probably would have been. You know, they faced persecution, so they went off and they went to some place that was not actually their home. They were there for a time and survived but other believers are living in the country that they are members of. They are, uh, uh, and yet they are still pilgrims. Us two today. My citizenship is in America, and that's where I live. But I too would be considered a pilgrim by this line of thought. So what does that mean? to the Bible? I didn't understand Jesus or Peter. So, um, even though you live here, you're not of here. Yeah, the fact that, you know, uh, because someone will ask you, oh, you know, uh, you know, someone will ask you, what are you? And, and that's a weird question. You know, you know, you say, oh, well, I'm a, I'm a plumber. Oh, I'm a pastor. I'm a, you know, whatever you are. Or, oh, I'm an American. You know, that's how you find your identity. Uh, you know, oh, I am of I am of the house of blank. I am, you know, in the lineage of so and so. How do you find your identity? Well, the idea here is that your identity, first and foremost, is as a believer, as a Christian, as someone from God's kingdom, not necessarily someone who's a member of the Roman Empire, not that's a person who's a who's a citizen of blank country. You are, you are a pilgrim because your home is not of this world. You are a foreigner. We are in this world, but not of it. And that's where he's addressing them from the beginning. You know, kind of reminding them. He's calling them pilgrims from the beginning to remind them. This is where they are currently, but it is not their permanent home. Much like a pilgrim uh, is not. Does uh, not belong where they are at currently. Uh, question number two: How does Peter describe the inheritance that awaits believers in Jesus Christ? Incorruptible and undefiled. 
Incorruptible. Okay, verse 4. To an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. So what does that mean? You, you, you gave me the answer. Now, what does it mean? Uh, incorruptible and undefiled. Yes, the inheritance is incorruptible and undefiled. It means it can't be taken. Mm. Good job, Tim. <laughs> this yes. world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. Absolutely. Doesn't we are pilgrims here. I'm sorry. Doesn't mean that you will be tested. And an inheritance pretty much talks about a future, you know, you know, when you talk about inheritance, you think about what's to come. You know, what's hard in the midst of trials, which is what they're all gonna be going through. You know, Nero is killing Christians and doing so in very uh, inhumane ways. I, I guess it's not a humane way to do it, but he's, you know, he, he, he is not only uh, killing Christians, persecuting them. He's trying to make an example of them also. Uh, and, and so it's hard to look past the immediate. When you're in struggles, when things are going bad for you, it's hard to look forward to the things to look forward to. You're kind of, your gaze is right on what's happening to you and how poorly things are going. And he's trying to help them look forward. And so you know, a king or a prince. A prince has something to look forward to. He knows there's going to come a day where he should become king, right? But there are some times a prince doesn't get to become king. You know, it's very possible, yeah, yes, he could die. But also, the father could squander the kingdom. Someone else, you know, that while some kingdoms may last generations, they all fall eventually. Someone else could come through, wipe out your kingdom, and claim it for themselves. Or a more everyday situation. You know, a son <coughs> will pro you know could could very well inherit his father's estate, his father's wealth. But all of that could go away too. We we talk about inheritance as being something inheritance in heaven is you know you know. We store up treasure. We don't store up treasure here on earth. We store up treasure in heaven. Because stored up treasure in heaven, what's not going to happen to it? It's not going to go away. Absolutely. Moths can't eat it. Rust can't destroy it. It's there. And so the inheritance that we have in Jesus is incorruptible and undefiled. It's going to be there. So he's making, having them put their gaze not on their immediate problems, but what's coming soon. All right. Uh, question number three. What insights in the trials does Peter give to his readers in this passage? What purpose do they serve? So. Encouragement. Yeah, verse 6, starting verse 6. In this you, you greatly rejoice, that now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So there's a couple different things he tells us about our trials. One... Are our trials going to last forever? No. no. He even says, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials. So know that it's not forever. It's hard to realize that in the midst of things. It is hard to see that when you are going through the storms of this life, it feels like they are never ending. But Peter's reminding us, it's only for a little while we may be grieved. And then, are those trials that you are going through, are they fruitless? Or is there a benefit to them? 
we see in verse 7? There's a benefit. Mm -hmm. we, we just don't know what it, maybe realize what it is. Yeah. Uh, the genuineness of your faith being much more precious than gold that, uh, that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory. So it's, it's interesting. Um, you know, we're called to praise God. We're called to trust him, to glorify him. And sometimes, let's just say you've been blessed beyond measure. You know, and people look at you and they see you praise God. Well, of course he praises God. He's got an easy life. You know, he's driving around in his fancy car, his big mansion. You know, it's, it's, it's very easy for him to praise God. But what happens when the world sees you praise God, uh, rejoice in him, even in the midst of you going through some of the hardest things in life? Um, the genuineness of your faith. Your faith is shown genuine when you still have faith even in the dark trials of this life. That's when your faith is tested. That's when it's proven genuine. Not when everything is going perfectly for you. Uh, so these trials help prove the genuineness of your faith and help glorify God in the end. Yeah, but as far as what other people think or say, I mean, you just look at Job and his three best friends were telling him he was, he needed to just go ahead and curse God and die, you know? So, I mean, I'm not, I don't think we should be so worried about what other people think about the trials that we're going through. So. Right, uh, but I think it proves it both to others and to you when when you are facing these trials. Like, I, I, try, to think, I try to think to myself, you know, if, if there ever comes a day I'm at the, I'm at the wrong end of the barrel of a gun, and someone asks me if, if I'm a Christian or not, I'd like to say I will still stand true and faithful even in those situations. But I also have to be honest with myself that there are certain things I can't know for sure until that happens. Right. And so, yes, it does prove you know, the genuineness of your faith. It is a reason for, but unbelievers will always find a reason to try to explain things away. You know, it doesn't matter if a man raises from the dead and proclaims God, proclaims Jesus as God. It doesn't matter if you are in the worst of things and yet you still, you know, you, know, you are a parent and your child is taken from you. You know, all these things could happen. If you can still glorify God, it will honor and praise him. But there will always be those who still try to explain it away one way or another. Yeah, we have Moses and the prophets and they still don't believe, so even if Absolutely. The dead. Yes, sir. They wouldn't believe. Um, question number four. Peter mentions the fact that his readers have never seen Christ, nor do they see him in their current trials. Verses eight and nine. What is his implied point? Uh, I'll just read verse eight and nine again. Whom having not seen you love, though now you do not see him, yet believing, you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. So he's telling them, to, you know, his readers, they have never seen Christ, nor do they see him currently in their trials. What is the point of what he's saying? Absolutely. How do we define faith? Trust. Okay. Anyone have a Bible in front of them? Can you can you turn to Hebrews eleven one? No, that's what faith does. That's not what faith is. The that's not the definition. That's what faith. The book tells you does. to go to Hebrews eleven one. Ah. Well, they're wrong. Well, there's there's two other verses also. Anyone got Hebrews on one? Yes. Okay, go ahead. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Okay, faith is the what? Is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Yeah, faith is faith is the reality of what's hoped for, the proof of what's not seen. Okay. 
Yes. Faith is... Yeah. Okay. Uh, somebody else take John 20, 29. Feels like it's splitting hairs. No, it, it's a substantial difference. They're saying faith is the engine, the thing that will give you assurance, but they're not saying what the engine is or how it actually functions. That's what I read. That's what I read. I'm not saying. Yeah, I don't. I don't think I agree with that. Um, anybody have John twenty twenty nine? Absolutely, good. And uh, one last one. Uh, 2 Corinthians 5 7. What was Hebrews? Sorry. 11 1. Where we walk by faith, not by sight. Absolutely. Call to walk by faith and not by sight. Yeah, this is what faith is. You know, even though we haven't physically seen Jesus yet, even though uh, we, we, we weren't there when all these things took place, we still by faith uh, believe in him. We still by faith believe the words of scripture. We by faith do these things. And so we have been called to do this. I have a question, Pastor Alex. Yes. Would you say you have faith in Alexander the Great? No. You've never seen him. You have very little evidence that he actually exists. But you believe that he's a, that he's a real person who did the things that he did, right? I believe Alexander the Great existed, yes. I mean, so it, 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 under, under the definition that we're giving, so wouldn't you have to say that faith... That you have faith in Alexander the Great. Well, I mean, you, you could say that, you know, like, 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 to an extent, you know, depending on your definition of faith, like, I have faith in this chair, I'm not going to fall down, right? Exactly. So. Yeah. You have faith, even though you haven't tested the chair to its extreme, you have right. faith that the chair will not fail you. <laughs> right. But the difference in these things as to what we've seen uh, between these verses we just read, everything about chairs has taught me that when I sit down, I will not fall over, right. right? It is, I'm not blessed because I did this without, you know, you know, you know uh, uh, blessed that, those. That faith is based on experience. Yes, there is faith that is based on these things. And Alexander the Great, or any other bits of information, like, you know, whether it be anything from my textbooks or such, um, again, it is based on something different than my faith in Jesus. I don't just believe in Jesus because it was something that I read in a book. Because how do you know the difference between that and anything else? Any other of the world religions who will tell you, hey, blank is true. No, I, 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 the reason why I believe that Jesus Christ existed is because of the words in a book. I believe that logically speaking, the Bible has an enormous amount of evidence and that if you follow that evidence to its conclusion, that the only logical conclusion is that Jesus Christ existed. So do I have the wrong definition? Am I, is my faith incomplete here? Well, you have to have the Holy Spirit, if too, that leads you. Yeah, that, that's, that's a big that. difference. If that's all you have. That's not all I have, but, that, right, right. but that's a, a major part difference. of it. That's what the faith part is when you're learning what you've read, right? That's, that's my forward, point. Right? That's actually my point. Okay. My point is that faith is more than just mere belief. Right. There, there's something far, far but more essential what? to it. But faith in what? So he's talking about faith in Christ. He more says, than logically Well, Ale believe. Alexander the Great, what he was talking about, I mean, how did he die? Not well. Not no, well at that's all. Not, that, but that's I'm not, just showing you the point. life he lived was point. himself. That's, that's, that's not the point. The point is but under the definition of faith that we have. If we're saying that faith is just belief in spite of reason or something, then we would have to say 
that I have faith in Alexander the Great because I don't really have enough evidence to say that Alexander the Great conclusively was a real person. But that's ridiculous. Nobody's gonna say, I have faith in Alexander the Great. That's a, that's a silly sentence. I have faith in Alexander the Great. <laughs> but you don't mean that. Silly people will have Okay, uh, I'm gonna get ready for the service. Uh, if you guys want to, uh, we'll pray and we'll go out. Uh, Jesus, please uh, use this time, use the study well for your glory. Uh, help us this morning as we get ready for uh, the certain head and let us just um, uh, praise you and what's gonna happen this morning. Amen. 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 Amen.